Welcome to ILTV's Israel Daily. I'm Tracy Alexander. And coming up in today's newscast, is support for planned annexations in the West Bank rising in the coalition? Alternate Prime Minister Benny Gantz seems to come around. Coronavirus lockdowns spring back in select Israeli cities. And ILTV takes on the latest social media challenge opposite an outgoing Israeli government official. Obstacles seem to be clearing as the days quickly count down to July 1 when Israel's government plans to start voting on a decision to expand over parts of Judea and Samaria. Defence Minister and Alternate Prime Minister Benny Gantz now softening his stance on the topic as Aaron Porras reports. A swift about turn by Defence Minister Benny Gantz signalling he could back unilateral annexations of parts of Judea and Samaria. In a briefing with military reporters, Gantz saying Israel won't continue to wait for the Palestinians, citing their persistent refusals to reach a peace deal with Israel, and adding, quote, if they say no forever to everything, then we'll be forced to move forward without them. As part of United States President Donald Trump's peace proposal, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu can begin to move forward with annexing some 30% of the West Bank come July 1 under his coalition deal with Gantz. But Gantz has remained adamant until now that the move should not be carried out unilaterally, despite the Palestinian authorities rejecting the Trump plan out of hand. Now social distancing, but not distance from social issues, hundreds of Israelis gathered in Kikar Rabin overnight, speaking out against the potential move. <laughs> Meanwhile, those who support Netanyahu creating a similar scene near the Tel Aviv Museum in a demonstration against judicial dictatorship. As the Israeli army prepares for possible violence in response to the move, <laughs> IDF Chief of Staff Aviv Kochavi praising the Israeli troops, but not before sounding a warning, seemingly pointing to potential pushbacks against the government's plan. <laughs> Airstrikes in Syria overnight are being linked to Israel. Seven people, including two Syrian soldiers and five pro-Iranian militia members, reportedly killed in the strike. The Sun on news agency saying military positions were struck west of Deir Azur, and at the same time, another military position was targeted near the southern city of Sawida, resulting in the death of two and wounding four other soldiers. Sana later reporting a third set of strikes early Wednesday near Hama. This video reportedly from the scene showing explosions on the ground. Now, this kind of stuff will still blow my mind. 3D printing. And now a breakthrough in Israel's Aviation and Aerospace Industries Department of Aerospace Science. Now, this cute little aircraft you're looking at has been printed on a 3D printer. Every inch of it, from wings to the wheels. The IDF Skies printer will be used to address Israel's security needs while also lowering production and development costs. While it's happening, citywide shutdowns over the second wave spread of coronavirus resuming in select parts of the country. Here's more. The lockdowns are beginning, several areas becoming restricted zones overnight. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu slapping bans on entry to primarily ultra-Orthodox areas. <laughs> אנחנו מחר בבוקר נבדוק גם יישובים אחרים. הדרך 
הבטוחה ביותר לעצור את המגפה זה שכל אזרחי ישראל יעטו מסכות וישמרו על מרחק. בכל מקרה, אנחנו מחר נידרש ליישובים אחרים ונודיע בהתאם את ההחלטות שלנו. Debates are continuing over whether to impose restrictions in Bat Yam near Tel Aviv. The health ministry saying only those who live in the restricted area will be able to enter, as well as those who work or go to school there. The decision going into effect this morning and will last for seven days. It comes as part of the government's bid to slow the spread of coronavirus after a surge in new infection cases, with some 459 new infections recorded in the past 24 hours. The death toll now at 308. Defence Minister Gantz speaking at the Home Front Command overnight. It is very important that the citizens will be able to take the government to give them the government to continue and not to be able to make the government to the government. In a war like a war, we will continue to be able to make the government to the government and we will continue to be able to make the government. Israel seeing the highest daily tally since numbers began to climb again late last month. April 15 was the last time virus cases passed 450 in a single day. Netanyahu taking to Twitter, addressing plans to renew that controversial Shin Bet tracking program for virus carriers, saying if the morbidity rates continue to rise, we will expedite the process of bringing the digital means to the approval of the cabinet before Sunday. And joining me with more now on the COVID-19 situation here in Israel is Steve Waltz from the Sheba Medical Centre in Tel Aviv. Steve, great to have you with us. Now, hospitals have been told to reopen their coronavirus wards and Sheba was in fact the first to open when the outbreak began. Briefly, tell us why. We were the first uh, chosen to open because we are technically the largest hospital or factually we are the largest hospital in Israel with the largest facilities and also our CEO happened to have been the Surgeon General of the Army before taking on this position. So he basically is the kind of person who never shies away from a, a mission impossible. And now you have reopened one of the coronavirus wards now. Despite what we're hearing in terms of the high numbers of infections, what kind of numbers are you seeing in the hospital? Well, obviously, they're going up uh, slowly again. Hopefully, they won't spike uh, the way they did in, in March and April. We now uh, are up to 20 uh, corona patients, and four of them happen to be uh, in critical condition. The big change, though, is that uh, I believe that between now and next week, if we don't see uh, what they call flattening the curve, all hospitals are going to have to go back into emergency mode, something that we really don't want to do. But the other difference is, is that we're now accepting mostly the moderately to seriously ill patients and leaving the lightly, uh, you know, those who are sick with light symptoms from corona, leaving them at home to be treated from home. Mm -hmm. and, and you're also working on an underground facility when you're talking about looking to the future. Tell us more about that. Well, originally we had an underground facility that uh, we had shut uh, a week ago that held up to about 50 critically ill uh, corona patients. We realized that uh, during the winter we may have a double whammy of flu and COVID-19, so we took a different car park underground and we converted it into a massive uh, corona facility that could hold up to 350 critically ill patients. Hopefully, we won't have to use them, but mm. right now, I, I'm not very optimistic. I have a feeling that it's going to be hopefully not at full capacity, but used a lot. Right, because, uh, you know, we're just moving into summer now, so you expect that we will still be dealing with this in the winter? We will be dealing with a double whammy, as I mentioned, between the flu virus and the coronavirus, which mimic the same symptoms. And our doctors here have told me that it's impossible to differentiate between the two without proper testing. And even those who will have to be diagnosed with the flu will actually also have to be put in some sort of quarantine for at least a few days because we don't want either the people who have the flu or people who have COVID-19 running around the country as we're experiencing now. And you can see the results as a result of all of the 
confusion that's out there. All right, and we also were hearing from people saying, oh, we're only seeing higher infection rates because we're seeing more testing and everyone's trying to make sense of the numbers. What do you say to the people that are saying this whole thing is a hoax? It's not only a hoax, it's quite dangerous. Uh, look, I sit on a perch here at a, inside a hospital where I can see doctors' faces very frustrated sometimes, uh, literally throwing their hands up uh, on occasion because this is a very dangerous disease. It destroys the lungs, and we're reading more and more about now that people who have symptoms that hang on for months at a time. It's true. There's no fake news here. This is a very dangerous disease, and people who don't take it seriously, God forbid that they're the ones who should be infected with it. They shouldn't know from it, as they say, because mm. it really is a dangerous disease. Absolutely, and let's hope that everybody does stay healthy and we do start to see numbers diminish. Steve, thank you so much for that insight. Thank you, Tracy. Well, summer is coming and not all children will be able to go to camp. And this has nothing to do with COVID-19. It's because not every family can afford it. So the charity organisation Yad Ezra Veshulamit decided to open a free summer camp in Jerusalem for some 80 girls whose parents don't have the extra funds. And to hear a little more about the initiative, Shalom Zidel is joining me in the studio. Shalom, great to have you with us. Thank you, Tracy. Now tell us a little bit about it. Why was it important for you to fund uh, the summer camp for these girls? Because part of our reasoning, Tracy, has always been not only just to feed the children, which of course is our primary objective, but to look to take a holistic approach to everything. Mm -hmm. So we want these kids to have fun. We want these kids to get out of their home environment, which very often is very crowded, doesn't have the computers, doesn't have many other games that most other kids have. Mm -hmm. They're really kids from really difficult backgrounds. So what kind of activities are they able to get involved with at the camp? All right, so we have swimming for them, we have other outings, we have amusement parks. We really want to take them out for five weeks, give them a real life to show them that it's not just difficult times, especially now. You know, the poor were here before COVID, yeah. the poor continue to be here after right. COVID-19, and we're there to say to, to these kids and their families, you're going to have a great time for the next five weeks. And they really get to be a part of it without paying anything at all. How do you finance it? We finance it through donations <laughs> okay. of, of the public, both in Israel and, and mm -hmm. the rest of the world. And uh, this is for 80 children, 80 girls between 6 and 12. Mm -hmm. It's going to cost about $35,000, and uh, through our website, we hope that people will listen to what we have to say and <laughs> donate. It's $435 per child. Wow. And even if people do it together, it would be lovely. Certainly. So each donation, each time you get to that total amount, it sends another girl to the summer camp. Absolutely. Fantastic. Absolutely. And so what kind of responses do you get from either the parents or the children that have attended these camps in the, in the years before? The, the parents are so grateful. We've got all kinds of letters from, from, from the parents who say that their girls have had a wonderful time. Mm. They've really experienced things they've never had in their lives before, honestly. It's that, you know, desperate a situation. So give us an, an idea as to kind of what background these, these kids are coming from, to give us an idea as to what kind of an opportunity it really is for them. I've seen some terrible, horrible stories, honestly. Um, people who, who've either one parent families, one parent has been lost to COVID or to other things previously. Mm. Um, obviously divorce one parent families. Mm -hmm. One of them is very sick, has an operation. And once all those things happen, their lives are, are tremendously impacted. So if we can take them out of that environment for those few weeks and right. give them a real fantastic time, provide them two meals every day. Beautiful. And infuse some positivity and joy in their life as kids, all kids should have. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much for bringing us that insight, Shalom. Thank you. You're very welcome. Thank you. Now, June is LGBTQ Pride Month in Israel, and various companies and organizations here are changing their attitude towards the proud community, spotlighting their unique experience in a bid to promote inclusivity and understanding. And we're delighted to host one such person who will tell us from his experience about the way Israeli society has done in this area, Ofer Erez. Welcome, Ofer. It's so great to be speaking with you. Now, you're actually a pioneer who made history here in Israel. You were the first transgender officer in the IDF. Tell us more. Um, apparently, yes. Um, I was drafted. Um, I was drafted in 2012. Back then, um, the IDF and uh, most of the militaries around the world, world uh, didn't um, 
uh, even acknowledge the fact that uh, trans people um, exist and serve in the military. Uh, but here in Israel, uh, we have a mandatory draft. Everybody serves in, in the military. And so for me, it was uh, almost an obvious uh, thing. Um, during the service itself, I realized that the um, challenges I faced is, uh, would, would be very common for any trans person. Um, and I did whatever I could in order to, um, to solve those challenges through uh, policy change, and I was actually able to uh, to write and initiate the first and ever um, IDF official policy regarding uh, trans service, and today I'm still serving in, in the reserve force, um, guiding, teaching, and consulting regarding uh, LGBTQ uh, inclusivity in the military and in other places. Wow. And how far do you think Israeli society has come when it comes to, I don't even like to use the word tolerance, but tolerance of the LGBTQ community? I think we are not uh, yet in the, I wouldn't call it tolerance. I know why, uh, why tolerance is complicated here. Let's call it diversity or inclusion. Um, we are not yet in, uh, in a place where I can say that there is full inclusion for the LGBTQ community, especially not in the periphery. But I think that visibility and awareness is much, much higher. And visibility is the first step towards uh, inclusion. Um, our ability to talk um, to communities that we have never been able to, um, to talk to before, very conservative um, uh, places and, um, and, and societies in Israel. Uh, so there is a constant progress and yet you always feel the pushback and mm -hmm. I think it's something that every activist especially LGBTQ activists in the, those days know exactly the feeling of you know in one hand you see a major prog uh, progress you can see um, companies like Microsoft who mm -hmm. invited me to the video we talked about um, supporting the community and in the same time we see from mayors to prime ministers in, in certain countries um, that are going backward. Mm. And very briefly, you referred to that video, uh, which gives tips to people about how to make, for example, trans people feel comfortable in the office. Very quickly, tell us what, what are the most important things that, that people should be paying attention to? Respect and sensitivity. I think for all of us, and, and my friends um, joked about my, uh, my video saying, all of your tips are relevant to all of us, not that just for trans people or LGBTQ people. It's about respecting one another. For example, don't get me, don't um, get me out of the closet if I, I didn't do it uh, myself. Uh, this is a private thing. I want to respect my privacy. Mm -hmm. uh, either um, how, how do you um, address people? Um, show respect. Uh, either through um, uh, pronouns or just don't ask me questions you wouldn't ask other people. And the final, um, the final tip is uh, be proud with us. And uh, I honestly believe that places from the military to Microsoft, uh, in each and every place, if you are a part of an organization that uh, supports uh, publicly the LGBTQ community, you would know you don't need to hide here. You can be whoever you want to be and you can make this place your home. Well, if I'm going to insert my opinion, there should be no other approach than, than compassion and, as you say, inclusivity between people. Thank you so much for being with us and sharing your perspective. Thank you. And happy Pride Month. Now, it's another viral social media challenge designed to raise awareness for an issue that needs support. Internet users around the world taking part in 25 push-ups for 25 days to help raise awareness for mental illness like post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, depression and suicide prevention. The rules are simple. If you're nominated, you'll need to start your 25 push-ups from the next day and for 25 days, do 25 push-ups and post them online. Now, one such participant has caught our eye here on Isle TV, and that's Israel's outgoing Director General of the Ministry of Science and Technology. And Ron Barrett joins us now. Ron, it looks like you're spending your time well since you finished up at the ministry. Tell us why it's important for you to support the 25 for 25 challenge and raise awareness about mental health. 
Yeah. Uh, first of all, I want to say that uh, my dear friend uh, and colleague, uh, Avi Khaliva, challenged me uh, via the Facebook. I immediately uh, accept the challenge as the issue is an important one and one which is uh, close to my heart. Uh, I uh, decided to take the challenge one step further and to do one hour sport a day. And today I took my uh, middle daughter, Liri, for the first time uh, surfing. Um, let's say she was uh, way, way better than me. <laughs> but uh, why, why is it important for you, Ron, to, to support issues like mental illness and, and particularly PTSD here in Israel? Yeah, uh, in my opinion, it is an issue which people don't speak about it enough. And there are people around us, uh, especially here in Israel, uh, because the army, who are really suffering and we don't even know about it. Uh, this challenge is a great way to get people to talk about it out in the open. Right. Now, we thought because you are doing your 25 push-ups every single day and you're documenting them online, we would like to add a little bit of a competitive element to it. And we have our anchor, Aaron Porras, here in the studio, ready to challenge you to a push-up duel. And we'll see who can <laughs> complete their 25 push-ups the fastest. So we'll let you gentlemen get into position. Aaron is ready in his upper body news anchor okay. gear and lower body sports I'm, gear. I'm, 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 all right, so you get ready. We'll get gentlemen in, in the positions. Aaron, I hope you've warmed up for this. I have not. <laughs> All right, well, here we go, guys. You've got 25 push-ups on the clock, and your time starts now. One, two, oh, Aaron. Five, six, seven. I don't know how to count everyone at once. Who's winning? I need help in the control room. <laughs> I think it's going to be a tie, and I am shocked. Aaron, I did not. Okay, no, Aaron's slowing down. Run, you're definitely in the lead. You're definitely in the lead. Aaron, 20. Oh, where are you up to? 20? Oh, there you are, Aaron. You have been beaten. Oh, no, no! But granted, I'm Ron, you have been practising. I'm going to finish it practising. Aaron, that's 25. it. 25! You, you are no longer in the competition. Ron, thank you so much for competing with our Aaron and putting him to shame. He will have to wear this down now in the office. And thank you for shedding a light on a very important <laughs> issue. Thanks, Ron. <laughs> Well, the show must go on, and no doubt Aaron is wanting to get outside from some fresh air after that, which is just what Israeli performing artists are doing as they try to keep the vibe alive while theatres remain closed. Aaron Porras has the story. Let's take this outside. Israeli dance troops are moving out of the studio spaces and into the great outdoors. Since permission hasn't quite been granted for theaters and performance spaces to open their doors, several troops are taking their performances into the open spaces, where social distancing can be kept and masks can stay on more comfortably. In the courtyard of Tel Aviv's Suzanne Delal Center, dance troupe Vertigo will perform their iconic work, Birth of the Phoenix, on June 30 and July 1. Jerusalem's Khan Theater will perform Under the Open Skies in July and August, with some of the theater's most beloved plays put up in the Ben Chinom Valley. And unplugged on the patio by the Jerusalem Arts Center, Beit Hansen, you can catch trumpeter Avishai Cohen, Tomer Yosef, Neta El Kayam, Rif Cohen, and Shai Tzabari in a summer of outdoor musical events. And now let's take a look at the weather forecast. Hopefully the skies will be a clear blue before the show start. A low tonight of 71 degrees Fahrenheit in Tel Aviv, that's 22 degrees Celsius. And partly cloudy tomorrow with a high of 80 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 27 degrees Celsius. And now before we go, let's take a look at what's going viral in Israel. Now that's the kind of outdoor concert I would like to see. Incredible. That's TikTok being used for good. All right, well, that is it for today's news. Today's exchange rate is 3.42 shekels to the American dollar. For more news from ILTV, please like ILTV on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and subscribe to our YouTube and Roku TV pages. I'm Tracy Alexander, and thank you so much for watching.